So, hopefully you like that instead of my typical good morning. So, anyways, 3B, hope you enjoyed that. Today we're going to talk about Unit 11. More specifically, we're going to start with theories of intelligence. Let's go ahead and get right to it. So here are your three objectives that we're going to work on today. It's all about defining intelligence, discussing uh, how different cultures influence uh, the definition of intelligence, comparing and contrasting the theories. Okay, this third one is going to be the main one that we're really going to look at today. Okay, so let's get right into a definition of intelligence. You should have already been writing down and discussing uh, what you think is definition of intelligence. Your textbook refers to it as a mental quality consisting of the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. With that definition, there are now two types of intelligence that I guarantee the AP test is going to ask about. All right, it might ask about both of them, it might just ask about one, but it will um, try to give you a scenario and you have to pick which one you think it is. So let's look at those two types. The first type we're gonna look at is called fluid intelligence. Think of fluid as something that is malleable, as something that can move, it is a liquid. So fluid intelligence refers to our ability to solve abstract problems and pick up new information and skills. Okay, if you can look at this graph, we have a lifespan down here at the bottom and the magnitude of uh, the effect of the intelligence. So see what you notice about fluid intelligence as you get older. Looks like it kind of dies off, right? Well, we'll explain that. The other kind is gonna be crystallized intelligence. Crystallized intelligence evolves using knowledge accumulated over time. See, crystallized intelligence, while it does seem to fade off with old age, it does not do so at the rapid rate that fluid intelligence does. Fluid intelligence seems to decrease as adults age. Research shows that crystallized intelligence holds steady or may even increase. For instance, a 20-year-old may be able to learn a computer language more quickly than a 60-year-old whereas the older person may well have the advantage on a vocabulary test or an exercise dependent upon wisdom. Okay, we're gonna jump right into an essential question. What arguments support intelligence as one general mental ability? And what arguments support the idea of multiple distinct identities? That's gonna lead us to our first theorist of intelligence, Charles Spearman. What you need to know about Charles Spearman is that he had the idea of one general intelligence, sometimes shortened to just the letter G. <clears throat> he granted that people often have special abilities that stand out. He used something called factor analysis, which is a statistical procedure that identifies clusters of related items. He had noted that those who score high in one area, such as verbal intelligence, typically score higher than average in other areas such as spatial or reasoning ability. Spearman believed in a common skill set, the G factor, underlies all of our intelligent behavior, from navigating the sea to excelling in school. This idea of a general mental capacity expressed by a single intelligence score was controversial in Spearman's day, and it still remains controversial now. He had an opponent to his one general intelligence, L.L. Thurston. Thurston gave 56 different tests to people and mathematically identified seven clusters of primary mental abilities. Word fluency, verbal comprehension, spatial ability, perceptual speed, numerical ability, inductive reasoning, and memory. You do not need to write those seven clusters down. Thurston didn't rank people on a single scale of general aptitude, such as the G value, but when, um, but when other investigators studied the profile of the people that he tested, they detected a persistent tendency. Those who excelled in one of those clusters, one of those seven clusters, generally scored well on the others. So the investigators concluded that there was still some evidence of a G factor. So we might then liken mental abilities to physical abilities. Athleticism is not one thing, but many. The ability to run fast is distinct from the strength needed to power lifting, which is distinct from the eye-hand coordination required to throw a ball on target. Okay, a champion weightlifter rarely has potential to be a skilled ice skater, yet there remains some tendency for good things to come packaged together. 
for running speed and throwing accuracy to correlate thanks to general athletic ability. So too with intelligence, several distinct abilities tend to cluster together and to correlate enough to define a small general intelligence factor. Okay, next essential question, how do Gardner's and Sternberg's theories of multiple intelligences differ? Okay, so we're going to learn about Gardner. Howard Gardner, uh, he was a guy that viewed intelligence as multiple abilities that also come in packages, okay? He had this theory of eight um, intelligences. As you can see there on this chart, the aptitude on the left. And here are some examples of people that uh, were exemplars in those different intelligences. So using such evidence, Gardner argues that we do not have an intelligence, but rather multiple intelligence. He identifies a total of eight including verbal and mathematical aptitudes assessed by standard tests. Thus, the computer programmer, the poet, the street smart adolescent who becomes a crafty executive, and the basketball team's point card exhibit different kinds of intelligence. He notes, if a person is strong or weak in telling stories, solving mathematical proofs, navigating around unfamiliar terrain, learning an unfamiliar song, mastering a new game that entails dexterity, understanding others, or understanding himself, one simply does not know whether comparable strengths will be focused in other areas. Now, this multiple intelligences can be uh, seen in what's called savant syndrome. This is a condition in which a person otherwise uh, limited in mental ability has an exceptional specific skill, such as computation or drawing. Um, the late memory whiz Kim Peek who uh, was a savant who did not have autism. Um, he was the inspiration for the movie Rain Man. In eight to 10 seconds, he could read and remember a page. And he learned 9,000 books, including Shakespeare and the Bible by heart. He learned maps from uh, MapQuest and could tell you directions within any major city. Yet he could not button his clothes. And he had little capacity for abstract concepts or sarcasm. Asked by his father at a restaurant to lower your voice, he slid lower in his chair to lower his voice box. Asked for Lincoln's Getty, Gettysburg address, he responded, 227 Northwest Front, Northwest Front Street, but he only stayed there one night, and he gave the speech the next day. I think you should be seeing a clip on uh, um, this is, uh, Kim Peek. Okay, so Sternberg, Robert Sternberg agrees that there is more to success than traditional intelligence, and he agrees with Gardner's idea of multiple intelligences, but he proposes a, a triarchic theory of three, not eight, intelligences. The first of his is going to be analytical, academic problem solving. This is assessed by intelligence tests, which present well-defined problems Having a single right answer, such as tests predict school grades reasonably well and vocational success more modestly. Second one, creative intelligence, is demonstrated in reacting adaptively to novel situations and generating novel ideas. The third, with practical intelligence, is required for everyday tasks, which may be, which may be ill defined with multiple solutions. Managerial success, for example, depends less on academic problem-solving skills than on a shrewd ability to manage oneself, one's task, and other people. Sternberg and Richard Wagner's test of practical managerial intelligence measures skill at writing effective memos, motivating people, delegating tasks and responsibilities, reading people, and promoting one's own career. Business executives who score relatively high on this test tend to earn high salaries and receive high performance ratings. And here, again, cut off a little bit, but you can see it. We've got Spearman's general intelligence, Thurston's primary mental abilities, Gardner's multiple eight, and Sternberg's triarchy. Um, and here are the summary and the strengths um, of those intelligences. So make sure you know the theories and, um, and a little bit about them, okay? Let's move on to the last essential question for today. What makes up emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence was uh, first thought of uh, by this man, Daniel Goleman, and the ability to perceive, understand, manage, and use emotions. Uh, it can be to perceive emotions, to recognize them in faces, music, and stories, to understand emotions, to predict them and how they change and blend, to manage emotions, to how to express them in varied situations, and how to use emotions to enable adaptive or creative thinking. Intellectual disability 
This was formally referred to as mental retardation, a condition of limited mental ability indicated by an intelligence score of 70 or below and difficulty in adapting to the demands of life uh, varies from mild to profound intellectual disability. And then the last slide we're going to talk about is uh, Down syndrome. So this is a condition of intellectual disability, but it's associated with physical disorders that are caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21. Okay, so make sure that going back through that you definitely understand fluid and crystallized intelligence. We're going to be working with those and seeing uh, if you can tell the difference. And then the theories, okay, Gardner, Sternberg, all those back at that chart. All right, um, hopefully you got all these down in your Cornell notes and you're marking them up. Um, and all right, that's it. I'll see you guys in class later.